China's Lus Plateau is a region that stretches for 640,000 square kilometers across north central China. Unspoilt valleys in neighboring Sichuan show us how it might once have looked. It's the sort of natural abundance that is necessary to support an emerging civilization. How could a landscape with such potential have been reduced to this? When Chinese scientists and civil engineers began to survey the area, they realized that several thousand years of agricultural exploitation had denuded the hills and valleys of vegetation. The relentless grazing of domestic animals on the slopes meant that there was no chance for young trees and shrubs to grow. The rainfall no longer seeped into the earth, but simply washed down the hillsides, taking the soil with it. Over millennia, this progressively destroyed the region's fertility. When this happens over an area as extensive as the plateau, millions of tons of silt are swept down into the Yellow River, which gets its name from the color of the fine loose soil. The mounting quantities of silt clog up the river, impeding its flow, contributing to the floods that give the river another name, China's Sorrow. In some areas, creating floating mud mattresses that attract passing tourists. A local problem becomes a national problem. In the dry season, the light, unprotected soil is swept up in the winds, causing the dust storms that are blown over China's cities and beyond its borders. On the plateau, the researchers realized that progressive degradation of the environment trapped the local population into a life of subsistence farming. It's a process that has occurred throughout the world where poor agricultural communities find themselves overusing their land in order to survive, depleting its fertility and further impoverishing themselves. One thing that became apparent early on is the connection between damaged environments and human poverty. In many parts of the world, there's been a vicious cycle. Continuous use of the land has led to subsistence agriculture. And generation by generation, this has further degraded the soils. The vital question we have to ask is, can this destructive process be reversed? <laughs> Fifteen years ago, Chinese and international experts were confident it could be. They decided that to prevent further erosion, it was necessary to cease farming on certain key areas to allow the trees and shrubs to grow back. But this could not happen without the consent of the farmers themselves. They took some persuading. Of course, a lot of people didn't understand the project. They weren't thinking in the long term. They want us to plant trees everywhere. Even in the good land. What about the next generation? They can't eat trees. What eventually convinced the local people was the assurance that they would have tenure of their land, that they would directly benefit from the effort they invested in the new project. The goal was to give a hat to the hilltops, give a belt to the hills as well as shoes at the base. The hat meant that the top of these hills had to be replanted with trees. The belt meant that terraces had to be built, 
to be used for crop planting and also for trees. The shoes were the dams which we had to build so that the hills could grow back to life and our economy as well as our lives could improve. Hills and gullies were designated as ecological zones to be protected. Farmers were given financial compensation for not farming on them and keeping their livestock pinned up. When I first filmed Mr. Ta Fu Yuan and his colleagues back in 1995, I had no idea this initiative could achieve such dramatic results. The effort that people put into converting their slopes into terraces has resulted in a marked increase in agricultural productivity. The higher yields are directly related to the return of natural vegetation in the surrounding ecological land. Now when it rains, the water no longer runs straight off the slopes. Trapped by the vegetation, it sinks into the ground where it is retained in the soil, taking weeks and months to gently seep down and irrigate the fields and terraces below. Restoration has occurred over an area of 35,000 square kilometers. The impact of such an enormous addition of vegetation goes far beyond the plateau itself. There's been a significant reduction in the soil rushing down into the Yellow River. As I've been traveling around the Lus Plateau, I've seen extensive changes. The vegetation cover on the hillsides, on the tops of the hills, and down in the valley, everything has changed. It's changed the lives of the people. And in fact, the people themselves have done this because they were the ones who, who changed their behaviors, terraced the fields, improved the soils, learned to protect the marginal areas. The changes are not simply on the hillsides. On the plains, you can see greenhouses that are filled with vegetables. This extends the growing season. It's very high value produce. The abundance and variety of new produce can be seen in the local market. Follow up studies have shown that incomes have risen threefold. And scientists point to a more global benefit. Plants, through photosynthesis, remove carbon from the air, countering the effect of human greenhouse gas emissions on the climate. In terms of climate change, we can say that the project made a double contribution. Firstly, the project was successful in restoring vegetation on a large scale. So many trees and so much vegetation grew up, and this definitely helped take carbon out of the atmosphere. Secondly, because the health of the Lowest Plateau's ecosystem has been so much improved, the region will be better able to resist the negative impacts of climate change. Vegetation reduces the greenhouse effect by taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Climate change is better withstood with trees. You know, humans, no matter how in intelligent we are, no matter how capable we are with all our technologies, we are helpless in the face of climate change. We have not yet properly understood the miracles performed by trees.
A measure of what restoring nature can do has been shown here on China's Lus Plateau, where farmers have continued to prosper despite the worst drought in decades. Since the beginning of the project, the soil that nurtures their crops has been accumulating organic material from plants and animals. This holds the moisture and contains carbon. What's interesting about this is all these root materials, all this other stuff, this is organic material. And this organic material is mixing together with the lus, the geologic soils here, and it's making a living soil. This is where the moisture resides. Yesterday it rained and there's still moisture in the soil. This is where the nutrients are recycled so that each generation of life emerges here. And this is where the carbon is. What's interesting about this, they made this field. This is new. So they're helping to sequester carbon. Living soils like this retain on average three times more carbon than the foliage above the ground. If we were to restore the vast areas of the planet where we humans have degraded the soils, just think what an impact we would have in taking carbon out of the atmosphere. As much as a quarter of the world's land mass has been degraded, and much could be rehabilitated in the way we have seen on the Lus Plateau. And we've only just begun to recognize the real value of natural capital. Surely investing in the recovery of damaged environments is a cost-effective way of solving many of the problems we face today. Why do we not invest an equal amount, if not more, into a shovel-ready technology, so to speak, which is nature's way of sequestering and storing carbon? It is actually by investing in our ecological infrastructure and ecosystems in expanding the ability of nature to sequester and store carbon that we have the greatest opportunity to do something. And the wonderful thing is, it's not only carbon sequestration. We're also faced with loss of ecosystems that will affect our food security, our water security. We're losing species on an unprecedented rate. So maintaining, restoring, protecting, expanding natural ecosystems has multiple benefits, immediate in terms of climate change, but also fundamental to the future of many of the services that we simply take for granted from nature. My hope is that the developed countries, those most responsible for climate change, will recognize the enormous potential of restoration. What we've seen in China, in Africa, and around the world is that it's possible to rehabilitate large-scale damaged ecosystems. If we can transfer the capital, the technology, and empower the local people to restore their own environment, it'll have enormous benefits. Restoration can sequester carbon, reduce biodiversity loss, mitigate against flooding, drought, and famine. It can ensure food security for people who are now chronically hungry. Why don't we do this on a global scale?